to what really matters. You can get a passion for God to be seen, a passion for God to be manifested, and get our eyes out of everything else. And all the closet sins and pocket sins and, and uh, uh, all of that stuff be put away and seek the Lord until he come and rain righteousness upon us. Ah, yes. Let God arise. That's the big picture. All right, Psalm 68. Uh, this morning, the first hour, we dealt with uh, Jesus shining in us on the individual level. And now let's go to a, 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 a bigger level. And then, uh, then the next several nights, we'll peel back some layers and some of the faith response pieces for us as individuals. But now let's look at Psalm 68. Thank you for coming back for the service this afternoon. And uh, glad you're here. And there was a lot of kids because there's a lot of empty spaces. <laughs> but uh, uh, they would, a second ago, I turned around, it was all full. And then uh, they're gone. But um, uh, they'll have a special, very special time. But let's look at Psalm 16. It's interesting. There are some statements in this psalm that uh, you would probably recognize. If you read the whole psalm today, we won't do that right now. You'd recognize certain ones. They're, they're, they're quoted sometimes in the New Testament. But there are statements in the psalm that are difficult to understand. In fact, the commentators bellyache about this. <laughs> uh, even Spurgeon said that Psalm 68 was very difficult to interpret. There's a commentator named Adam Clark. He said, I know not how to undertake a comment in this psalm. It is the most difficult in the whole Psalter. But thankfully, we're only going to look at the first three verses. <laughs> and we'll ask the Spirit of God to open our understanding and be our teacher. So if you have your Bible open, these are amazing words. Verse 1, let God arise. Let his enemies, hmm, as wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. But let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. The title of the message is taken right off of those first three words. Let God arise. Let's pray and ask the Spirit to open our understanding. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity of this hour right now. Thank you for every person that's here right now. Now, Spirit of the living God, would you be our teacher? Would you quicken us? Would you open thy eyes of our hearts to see the truth, the grand truth that is connected to these amazing words? And Lord, I pray that you would move us from wishful thinking to convince confidence about what this text is talking about. And Lord, give us a right Bible sense of hope in this day and age in which we find ourselves. So Lord, breathe on us now. Speak to us now. May we know that you are speaking to us. May we walk out and know that we've heard your voice. And so Lord, use the truth once again to accomplish your purpose. Again, Lord, I plead the victory of Jesus when he said it is finished and won the victory over the world, the flesh and the devil. Would you manifest that now? So in your name, we exercise your authority over any powers of darkness that would seek to hinder. Trust in you once again that that not be allowed. So, Lord, make this time count. We trust you to do it. We thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. 30 percent of the 8 billion people on planet Earth right now have never once heard the name of Jesus. That's 2.4 billion. Let God arise. In the USA, and in fact, in Western culture, there are many churches, more churches closing than opening. Let God arise. Every conceivable attack is being waged on God's plan of one man and one woman in marriage. Let God arise. Actual history is being replaced by propaganda 
in our educational institutions. So let God arise. 29% of all U.S. adults claim no religious affiliation. Let God arise. 60 million babies have been killed through what they call abortion, which is none other than cold-blooded murder. Let God arise. But what does that mean? Does God still do this? Does he still arise in our era? And what is our responsibility? So let's look to the word and the spirit for the answers to those questions. First of all, let's deal with that first question. What is the meaning of let God arise? Now, if you look at your inscription above the psalm, it says, and of course, in the Hebrew Bible, this is a, a, part, of, a part of verse one, to the chief musician, a psalm or song of David. Now, this lets us know time period. Obviously, David wrote this. So at that time period, when God used David, to bring in the golden era, golden age of Israel under him and Solomon. So it's at that time period. But when David said these words, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. The Jews, the Israelites would have known that David was quoting from Moses that is recorded for us in the book of Numbers. Now, it's interesting. Sometimes, you know, you recognize certain verses. Well, the same is true with anything in literature. If a politician were to stand up and say four score and seven years ago, we would know that it's not original creative right, <laughs> uh, that it's a quotation of Abraham Lincoln. So when David says these words, his audience knew this was a quotation of Moses back in Numbers chapter 10, verse 35. It was when they were in the wilderness. It's when God led them through that visible pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. Absolutely amazing. And when that pillar of either cloud or fire moved, that's when the priest picked up the Ark of the Covenant and uh, uh, began to follow the Lord in that way. And that's when Moses would say, rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered and let them that hate thee flee before thee. So they would have known that. Now, it says here, let God arise, let his enemies doesn't say our enemies. They might be the same. They might not. <laughs> it says, let his enemies be scattered. That means there is a spiritual warfare nuance in this text. In fact, early church history records that the men of God in previous eras understood this. Back in the fourth century, there was a man by the name of Athanasius who went at the uh, who at one of the big church councils defended the doctrine of the Trinity, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. But of the psalm, he said, quote, evil spirits may be put to flight by this psalm, end of quote. Another guy named Antony, we read of him, quote, he fought against the devil with this verse and worsted him, end of quote. Don't you like that, worsted? <laughs> they made a verb out of it, <laughs> uh, but worsted him. Fascinating. Now, what happens? Verse two says, as smoke is driven away, just like there's smoke and there's a little bit of breeze and it's just driven away. So drive them, God's enemies, away. This is a strong prayer. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked, God's enemies, perish, now notice this phrase, at the presence of God. Verse three, but let the righteous be glad and let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. In other words, God wins and the righteous rejoice and even exceedingly rejoice. Now, why do they rejoice? Here's the key thought. The phrase, let God arise, in verse 1, is defined by the last phrase of verse 2, at the presence of God. The word presence is that term panim. It's translated face in some passages, presence in others. Let God arise. It has something to do here with the presence of God, the manifest presence of God. Now, there are some comparative passages 
prior to the captivity, when Israel was on the decline in the northern kingdom, God's prophets were challenging them. And Isaiah, in Isaiah 63, begins a prayer. In Isaiah 63, 15, he starts by saying, look down from heaven. And his prayer continues. And it begins to build. And we come to the climax of his prayer. In Isaiah 64, and verse 1, he's already said, look down. And now that he cries out, oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Hmm. Psalm 68, let God arise at thy presence. Isaiah 64, rend the heavens and come down at thy presence. But again, you have the spiritual warfare nuance. Rending the heavens. In Ephesians chapter 6, And the powers of darkness are detailed there. It talks about the powers of the air. The reality is, Satan knew how to use the powers of the air long before mankind figured out airways. How did Satan get a lie around the globe like that prior to modern technology? It's the powers of the air. See, there can be interference in an atmosphere. Why is it? That all throughout the world, God's men can get up on the Lord's day and stand up and having cried out to God to be filled with the Spirit and they're trusting the Lord and they are filled with the Spirit and yet there's static in the atmosphere. There's difficulty in the atmosphere. Those who come to drink do drink. They get help. Everybody else just sits there. When's this going to be over? See, there's, there's this interference in the atmosphere. It is the powers of darkness. It's the powers of the air. And so the heart cry of Isaiah is, God, would you run through? Run the heavens and come down. What that is, there are moments when the powers of darkness are told to get out and the power of the Holy Spirit displays the presence of Jesus. That's the heart cry. The manifest presence of God in the captivity days. In Daniel chapter 9, you read one of the greatest prayers for revival you'll ever read in the inspired text of Scripture. And in Daniel 9, 17, he cries out, God, would you cause your face, there's our word, your penny, your presence to shine. And then we go to Ezekiel. Back in chapter 34, 35, one of those chapters, that's where you have the phrase, there shall be showers of blessing. But then you come to chapter 36, and the following, and you have that prophecy of the war of Gog and Magog, which will happen. And uh, that's where the northern nations combined with Persia, which is Iran. And uh, they come down on Israel to attack Israel to take a spoil. Now, when I was a kid, you could have asked, well, what spoil are they going to take? Olive oil? <laughs> but now they've got oil. Oil. <laughs> And natural gas, some of the greatest reserves in the globe, are right there on that little tiny piece of real estate. And there are nations that are bankrupting themselves. And they're going to need supplies. And there is coming a war. I think we might get to watch it. Not get to, have to. But nonetheless, when those northern nations converge with Persia, modern-day Iran, and they come down on Israel... And tragically, we read in Ezekiel that no human nation comes to Israel's aid. We see the stage being set right before our eyes. But then God comes to their aid. And God wins the war for his people. And we're told that as a result, the nations will know that I am the Lord. And God's people, Israel, will know that I am the Lord. Then he says this. Ezekiel 39, 29. Neither will I hide my face, any presence, any more from them. For I will have poured out of my spirit. So the phrase God pouring out his spirit, which is also in the New Testament, is defined in Ezekiel 39, 29 as God no longer hiding his presence. In other words, that is God manifesting his presence. Uh, Friends, do you catch the imageries here? Let God arise. God rending the heavens and coming down. God shining his face and God pouring out his spirit are all defined by the same thought. It is the manifestation of the presence of Almighty God. Wow. That's the meaning of let God arise. 
You see, we have to understand that there is a difference between God's omnipresence and his manifest presence. God is everywhere present. But right now in the city, <laughs> thousands of people are not at all conscious of God at this moment. God is not in their thoughts. But do you know if God were to pour out his spirit on Brooklyn, a whole greater New York City area, every human being saved or lost would be arrested with an awareness of the presence of God. Don't you think we need that? See, seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. The filling of the Spirit is to be continual for a child of God. But the outpouring is seasonal. You can't have rain all the time or you can't bring in the harvest. And there are those times, times of refreshing, seasons of refreshing. Now, when God does this, it's fascinating. There can be different levels of intensity. When I talk about God banishing the powers of, the, of darkness and manifesting his presence, this is not weird. You have been, you've been in church for any length of time at all. Undoubtedly, you've been in some services where a holy hush came over that service. This just happened a few days ago in a meeting I was at in Canada. But there's just everything changed in the dynamic. And you've been in a service like that where there's that holy hush and everyone's riveted. And you can hear a pin drop. God's in the room. Okay, that's what we're talking about. But there can be different levels of intensity. That presence or awareness of God can get so strong that people cannot control their emotions. I remember preaching to the neighborhood Bible time guys one time several years ago. And one of those guys began to, 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 to shed some tears. And then it got greater and it got, he began to sob. And I had to stop preaching because I couldn't now, I couldn't now preach the sobbing. And God said, let the guys meet with me. And the thing just erupted into a, an amazing prayer meeting. And then they all stopped in the same moment. And God said, finish your sermon. <laughs> that was unusual. I got to finish my sermon. <laughs> but you know, what is that? Why do we read sometimes in the accounts of the great revivals that people audibly cry out for mercy? Well, can you imagine if there was no interference in the atmosphere? You know that phrase in Thessalonians that says the word of God? Talks about it having free course and being glorified, giving its weight. Why is it that a spiritual man can get up and preach the word of God and people say ho hum <laughs> and go back out and nothing changes? See, there's interference, there's that static, as it were, in the atmosphere. And a man uh, filled with the spirit can preach. And those that uh, have come to drink, they will drink. And everybody else will sit there. But what happens if you take that same atmosphere? And now there is this manifestation of the presence of God. Not only do you have a man preaching as a spiritual man. Not only do you have those uh, that are thirsty coming to drink. But everybody else is aware that they are at the fountain of living waters himself. He's there. He's in the room. And everyone has a chance to be blessed by the blesser himself when he manifests his presence. And so the reality is there can be these different levels of intensity. It can be like that sweet, holy hush that comes over, or it can get more intense. And uh, uh, the cry, uh, crying out for mercy, the reason they cry out for mercy is that when you take all of the interference out and the word actually has that free course, and is given its weight, it comes down on the hearts of God's people. Those who are already right with God shout for joy like they did in the Congo revival. Uh, at the same time, you had people shouting for joy and shouting for mercy because those who had sin in their life, when they come face to face with God, they began to shout and literally cry out for mercy. Do you know what would happen in this room? I don't know exactly what the manifestation would be, but if we were aware of the presence of God on that level, if there's sin, in your heart, you're either going to run out the door or you're going to fall on your knees and cry out for mercy. Seasons of refreshing. Now, God knows what level of intensity we need at a given time. It's not a matter of seeking a particular story. It's a matter of seeking God. But the point is, there can be different levels of intensity. There can be different levels of geographical breadth. 
God can move in a living room. And he has wonderful accounts. God can move in a dorm room. Beautiful. God can move in an auditorium. My son went to camp before his uh, first year of college. And uh, he'd gone to camp twice that summer. And coming into the second camp, I didn't know this till later. He told me, he said, God, this has got to be more than going through the motions of a camp. I need you to speak. And in that week, they had a service. It was the middle of the week. And the presence of God became so real that a bunch of kids got right with God and it changed the whole dynamic of the rest of the week at camp. The teenagers from my home church, Ann Arbor Baptist Church, Ann Arbor, Michigan, said to the youth leader, they were meeting in a gym, 500 teenagers in a gym at that camp. And they said, God was in the room. Now, our teenagers don't talk that way. You know what it means? God was in the room. That was a gymnasium. It can be a community. It can be a whole region. The point is, it is an awareness of the presence of God. So there can be different levels of intensity. There can be different levels of geographical breadth. And there can be different levels of duration. I told you the story in the uh, Sunday morning there in uh, 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 Worcester, South Africa in 1860, when God moved and, and they would have these services that would go to 3 a.m. And this went on for days and so on. There can be different levels of, of duration. I've had a couple of preacher friends last year when God was moving down in Kentucky at that school called Asbury. Uh, there's a spillover in a lot of different places. And uh, two of my friends uh, would call me and said, here's what God just did. And one of them at a service went for three and a half hours. I think they were both. Hey, now that I think about it, they were both three and a half hour services. This was an independent Baptist church. And time was lost. Well, this can go on for hours. It can go on for days. Sometimes it goes on for weeks, sometimes even months. So there can be these different levels of intensity, geographical breadth or duration, but it's the same dynamic. It's life again. You see, individually, it's when you are as an individual are filled with that life of God so that the beauty of Jesus can shine, as we talked about in the first service. But corporately, there can be when God fills the atmosphere with his life. That's that outpouring of that spirit. That's when there is that awareness of God. And when you see God for who he is, you see sin for what it is. And that's why people fall on their face or they run. Because God is there. But those that are backslidden believers and get honest with God, the blood of Jesus cleans them up. And you'll hear them cry out. And you'll read it in the accounts. I'm clean. And those who are born again will say, I'm saved. Because God moved. So what is the meaning of let God arise? It's the spiritual manifestation of the presence of God. It's not a physical manifestation. It's spiritual. But it's just as real as if it were physical. Secondly, does God still manifest his presence in the New Testament era? In other words, does God still manifest his presence in the 21st century? Well, he moved on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. He moved again in Acts 4, again in Acts 8, again in Acts 9, again in Acts 10, again in Acts 13. For that 50-year period, yes, there were a number of seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Several years ago, I think it was 2016, we walked through in one of the conferences here, the major revivals of church history. But for today's purposes, let's jump to North American history for a moment. And consider this dynamic of God arising, God rending the heavens and coming down, God shining his face, God pouring out his spirit. When the pilgrims came to North America, they were seeking God. That's an interesting dynamic. There was religious persecution going on in Europe. Many preachers in Great Britain, uh, England in those days were imprisoned. I'm sure there was a lot of intercession that went up from those prisons. You had the great move over in a part of Germany called Moravia, the great Moravian revival, 1727. But then on this side of the Atlantic, God began to breathe in this turf, it's not yet called the United States. It was the colonies. They were still a part of Great Britain. And uh, in New England, we read, uh, Jonathan Edwards writes, 
about a surprising work of God that took place in Northampton in 1735. And he says, you know, you can walk out on the streets and the average conversation you overhear is about God. Wouldn't that be neat instead of politics and weather and the sports? God. God on the move. But that was just the beginning. God brought the big voice of George Whitfield in. Guys like George Whitfield, they didn't need these microphones. They had these big lungs. And they could just, these guys had such big voices, they couldn't whisper. I'm not a guy like that. You can't whisper. He's got this big voice, you know. Uh, well, that's Whitfield had one of these voices. According to Ben Franklin, on one occasion, 30,000 people were there and could hear the voice of George Whitfield. But more than that, they were hearing the voice of the Spirit of God. God was on the move. I mean, God was on. The, it was an awakening. They said that the, uh, whenever they would announce the next uh, town where Whitfield would preach, that you could look out across the horizon and see clouds of dust over the various roads that came and converged on that town as people walked on foot and some on horseback and some in carriages would come to hear the word of God preached. We call it today the first great awakening. Multitudes were born again. Well, the aftermath of that went for several decades. And then we had the American Revolution, which was not a rebellion like the French Revolution. It was British citizens standing up for British rights that were being violated by the British crown. And thus the American Revolution and the beginning of the United States of America. When all that happened, uh, we became a nation. 4,000 people a day were coming through Ellis Island right here in your city. 4,000 a day. 4,000 a day who knew not the power of the first great awakening. Do you know that by the time you get to the 1780s, well, that's pretty early on with us as a nation, the statistics on immorality would be like reading the paper today. 1780s, you need to know that. The statistics on drunkenness were like reading the paper today. 1780s. Atheism was so strong in the big Ivy League schools that Christians had to meet in secret, in fear. For what was happening. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? From recent days and what was going on. In fact, things were so bad in our country that Chief Justice Marshall wrote that the church was too far gone to ever be revived. Now, he was wrong. But that's how bad it was in the 1780s. And then a guy named Isaac Backus, happened to be a Baptist preacher. And some of his friends up in Maine, some Baptists, some Congregationalists, decided that they needed to pray. They had heard about some prayer meetings that were taking place in, 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 in England, uh, a union of prayer that had uh, started because they had read uh, a work on prayer by Jonathan Edwards and God was moving over there. So they decided we need to do the same. And God stirred them and they, they wrote up a call to prayer. They circulated it around the churches of New England. It's therefore called the circular letter. It was circulated in 1795, and it was calling for one day a quarter for the churches to stop everything and cry out to God for another effusion. That's the word outpouring of the Spirit. It's what we're talking about. One day a quarter, that was it. And they heeded. And those prayer meetings were so powerful, they stepped it up to once a month. Now, that began in 1795. By 1798, New England was aflame in revival. The beginning of the Second Great Awakening. As you move into the early 1800s, it began to spread through the middle co uh, colonies right here in New York City. Yes, New York State. Yes, even New Jersey. Now, you know God's work. <laughs> and it began to go down the eastern seaboard. And it began to move westward over time. And uh, uh, so the great camp meetings, the Cane River camp meeting and the Red River camp meeting and some of those camp meetings with uh, uh, Peter Cartwright, and Lorenzo Dow. And Robert Sheffy got on the move. There was a surge across the colonies in the 1820s. Another surge in the 1830s. Wow, this was a long awakening. It went from 1795 to 1842. The longest awakening America has ever known. It is what made us a Christian nation more than any other contributing factor. But we became prosperous. 
People took their eyes off of God. You know, you can sink pretty fast like a rock in the ocean. And you don't have God as your life vest to keep you buoyant on the top. And so things were not going well. And uh, there was a need for another awakening very, very quickly. And the third great awakening, sometimes called the prayer revival. Often Jeremiah Lamphere is referred to. I will talk to him about him in just a second right here in this area. But before it ever hit here, the origins of prayer, according to J. Edwin Orr, who wrote the song, Search Me, O God, British historian and evangelist, said the earliest origins of the third great awakening were among the slaves in the plantations in the south of the U.S. And they were crying out to God. And remember, <laughs> that time period, civil war is going to happen and and the Emancipation Proclamation. But these, 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 these believers down there in those plantations were saying, God, would you come? There was another prayer stream in Hamilton, Canada. And I believe as an answer to their prayers, God stirred a Dutch Reformed guy named Jeremiah Lamphere. Now, you know God's stirring when a Dutch Reformed guy gets stirred. And I can say that because my name is Van Gelderen. My my roots are Dutch Reformed, though I'm a Baptist now. Well, he wrote up a call to prayer, circulated it. I mean, uh, actually posted it on buildings all over Manhattan. That on such and such a day, uh, 12 noon, they would meet for prayer. They would promptly dismiss at one. Asking for God to pour out his spirit once again. Well, when he got there at 12, it was just him. After 30 minutes, he heard somebody come up the steps. They dismissed at one with six. The next week, they had 20. The next week, they had 40. And then, October the 14th, 1857, the stock market crashed. Banks failed. People were jobless. And within weeks, 3,000 people a day were coming to pray. In fact, they had to move it to daily from weekly, and they had to start them all over the place because that little room, that little office building on Fulton Street in Manhattan couldn't handle everybody. And now you had people all over the city praying for God to move. Not just one prayer, many prayer meetings. And the presence of God began to be felt right in New York City. In fact, it was so powerful, according to one account, one of our military ships that when coming into harbor, when they came into the geographical vicinity where the presence of God was manifested, they felt the presence of God. And these guys had no idea what God was doing in New York City at that moment. And they were under such conviction of sin that many of them began to cry out for mercy and were born again as a result. And then Boston began to pray. In Philadelphia, they began to pray. And yes, the eastern seaboard cities, and not just cities, according to J. Edwin Orr, it was the, it was the, uh, the smaller towns and uh, villages as well. But it began to move westward. And yes, Chicago began to, yes, Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a mess. But uh, uh, they began to pray all the way out to San Francisco, California. The cities, the towns, the villages, there were these prayer meetings. And they would pray from noon to one. There was no one human leader. That's why I'm not naming any names. Uh, God was using all sorts of people. And then in the evenings, they started holding services. Do you know that by the time you get to 1858, just a few months later, as these services were taking place in the evenings, the prayer meetings at noon, 15,000 souls a day were putting their faith in Jesus Christ. That's the USA third Great awakening. God was working in other places too. I'm limiting my comments to North America, but God on the move. Powerful. That's when D.L. Moody, who I mentioned this morning, got uh, fired up and God used him. And so for several decades, the wave of that awakening continued. But by 1899, Moody recognized we need another one. He started a prayer meeting along with a guy named R.A. Torrey, not yet a uh, an itinerant evangelist, but there at Moody uh, Bible Institute, Moody Church, the two of them uh, ministered together. They started a prayer meeting, and a handful of people began to come. Another uh, prayer meeting was started in Keswick, England, as a part of the Keswick Convention, praying for a worldwide revival. Well, Moody died that very year, 1899, did not get to see what he began to pray for, but the prayer meeting did not die. And as it continued, R.A. Torrey one night at midnight told the men, I know it's time to dismiss, but he said, I feel led to stay. 
He said, if you feel led to stay, uh, then you're welcome to join me. A couple of guys did. And that's when R.A. Tory told the Lord, Lord, we're praying for a worldwide move. If you want to use me, I make myself available. Well, God was going to answer that prayer uh, when things got to going. But uh, God began to breathe. And there was an international move that started in South Africa in 1901. It hit Wales in 1904. It hit the U.S. in 1906. 57 nations were touched by uh, 1913. Now, in America, cities like Atlanta, Georgia, and Denver, Colorado, were shutting down their department stores on the days of prayer so that everybody could and would go to the day of prayer. The Colorado legislature was shutting down session so that they could attend. This is the USA, 1906. The University of Michigan, I'm from Ann Arbor, saw a move of the spirit in 1906. Now, friends, it was a powerful time of revival. This is when Billy Sunday was preaching and Sam Jones and Bob Jones Sr. In other parts of the world, you had Gypsy Smith. R.A. Torrey went uh, from America to other places. He saw 100,000 people converted in Australia, 70,000 in Great Britain. But God was doing the same kind of thing right here. Whole cities would come together in these massive crusades. It's the fourth great awakening. The peak year for the U.S. was 1906. 57 nations, as I say, were touched. It was in a mighty time worldwide. Well, back in the States, when the tide went back out, you had the roaring 20s. That wasn't so good for spiritual living. And the citywide crusades with Bob Jones Sr. and Billy Sunday and Sam Jones and others, they stopped. They were not happening. It became a godless era. You come into the 1930s, there was a young evangelist by the name of John R. Rice who got burdened to see God work again. And uh, he was burdened that God would bring back in the citywide crusades. And yes, by the end of the 30s, God was moving. And he had a, a meeting here in New York State. I think it was in Buffalo where there was a remarkable move of the spirit. And that paved the way in the 40s for a young, tall evangelist named Billy Graham. And friends, in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, God moved. Now, in the late 50s, I do believe he got too broad. And uh, that uh, is unfortunate, but you cannot deny that in the late 40s and early 50s, God was on the move. And yes, in other places too, the Lewis Revival, the Congo Revival, it was another era. Then the tide went back out. You have the 1960s. The hippie movement. Why the hippie movement? It's because teenagers were disillusioned. A lot of things happened in the 60s. John F. Kennedy uh, was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Uh, teenagers found out that their government, in, regarding to, uh, the, in regard to the war in Vietnam, that the government was lying to them. 1960s. And the hippies were just done with establishment. And in their throw off establishment politically, they kind of threw God out too. And uh, you had... Uh, you know, the typical hippie look, you know, with the flowers in their hair and the long hair and all of that. <laughs> and uh, that was the 1960s. Fascinating. 1967, they had a big festival in San Francisco. They thought it would be utopia. All the hippies were coming together. And in that festival, they were mugging each other, ripping each other off. And now they're really disillusioned. Their own movement stunk. And then... God, who cares about those teenagers? Just like he did the teenagers in Nineveh, in the book of Jonah. God began to move. Those teenagers began to get saved. There was one in particular. He just became a magnet, and God used that guy to bring many to Christ. And then another preacher was the one who discipled them. And you have what you call today the Jesus Revolution. Now, I realize we have some independent Baptists say, well, now, wait a second. <laughs> they don't look right. Well, I understand. But let me just say this. 
When teenagers are leaving marijuana parties to go to Bible studies, you can't chalk it up to the devil. It passes the test of 1 John 4. It really does. And at that time period, that's when Calvary Chapel, which was a very small group, they were the conservative edge of charismatism. They exploded at that time under Chuck Smith because he was welcoming uh, the hippies. He didn't at first. It was his wife. He said, wait a second, Chuck, we got we to care about these kids. Well, at the very same time that that happened with exponential growth over there, independent Baptists, believe it or not, this was, this was our golden age. We exploded. Prior to the late 70s and 80s, independent Baptists were very, very few. But because of what was happening in the late 60s, early 70s, independent Baptists exploded. And by the time you get to 1980, the largest church in many states was an independent Baptist church. Never been that way since, but that's what was true in 1980. Wow. At the same time, you had the conservative resurgence among the Southern Baptists. Unheard of historically. They had gone so liberal that you had unsaved men teaching in the seminaries. Unbelievers. But there was this conservative resurgence and takeover at the same time. Why? It's because God was in the land. That's when Asbury College, it was famous in the news a year ago, was famous in 1970 because of a chapel that went uh, for 244 hours. (laughs) You think I preach long? (laughs) 244 hours. It was so powerful that that students were invited to other campuses and the fire jumped to 130 campuses in 1970. You had the Canadian revival. I was just in Saskatchewan last week, this Sunday. I just left there Wednesday. I flew out of Saskatoon. In Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, 1971, God came down on a congregation of Baptists of 600 people. That thing exploded and uh, it kept growing. They went over to the Christian Missionary Alliance Church, the Anglican Church. I had to find building after building because the thing just kept growing. And people from any denomination that had a heart to be blessed by God came and God moved. It shook half of Canada. They were drawing 4,000 people a night within months. Wow. There's more. That was a powerful time, folks. When I was a kid, I was born in 1962. So I remember some of this. And I remember that people got saved by the droves in meetings like this back in that day. Why? Because God was in the land. There was there was the there was that presence of God. I didn't realize it at the time, but, but anybody that had a heart to be blessed was getting blessed. Wow. It was beautiful. Do you see it? 1740s, early 1800s, 1857, 58, 1906, early 1900s, late 40s, early 50s, late 60s, early 70s. You know, we've had six seasons of refreshing that were of a national import in the history of this turf called North America. But do you see it? 1740s, early 1800s, 1857, 58, 1906, late 40s, early 50s, late 60s, early 70s. And now it's 2024. Let me tell you something, friend. It's time. It's time for God to work. May our hearts look to the one who is more burdened about this than we are. Peter tells us that God delays his coming, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason why we've not yet had a rapture is because of the heart of God to save the savable and revive the revivable before things radically change. And God's always been that way. He sent his prophets to Judah and said, judgment's coming. But it kept getting bumped off because of revivals, five of them. Nineveh, Jonah comes in 40 days and you're out of here. (laughs) It's not quite what he said, a little paraphrase there. But 40 days and the judgment of God is going to fall. They repented. And that judgment that was to fall in 40 days was delayed to 150 years later. Now, friends, God cares. And we're told that that revival in Nineveh was because of 120,000 young people. And it wasn't their fault that their parents were so wicked. 
And I recognize we live in a day where things are just going crazy. It's like everything's coming apart at the scenes. So I'm going to tell you something. Gen Z, God cares about. And there are thousands of Gen Zers in the last 15 months that have come to Jesus Christ. They may not all look like what we think they should look like and do what, you know, what I'm telling you. If they're coming to Jesus, it passes the test of 1 John 4. And friends, may we take heart. That brings us to the third question. What is our responsibility? And by the way, let me say this. When God does this, sometimes it changes the nation back to God. Sometimes it prepares the church for coming persecution. That's what happened in China and their big revivals before the coming of uh, Mao Zedong in 1950. Perhaps that's what's happening here. I don't know. But the reality is, what's our responsibility? Well, what is our text? It's a prayer. What is Isaiah 64? It's a prayer. What is Daniel 9? It's a prayer. You see, it's heart cry. God, would you do it again? You see, that was the prayer of the psalmist. Let God arise. It was the prayer of Isaiah. Rend the heavens and come down. It was the prayer of Daniel. God, cause your face to shine again. Friends, it's not just so that we can have, you know, our stock market, this, that. Look, no, it's for God to be glorified. Everything else may crash. Yes, we may lose all sorts of stuff. Yes, we might even have persecution. Probably so. But God's glory will be seen. God's glory will be felt. Let God arise. They cried out in Acts chapter 1. God manifested his presence in Acts chapter 2. This is how it works. Now, friends, what is it going to take for American Christianity to wake up to the need of God? How bad does it have to get to awaken us? We are so comfort-oriented and convenience-oriented. And I get it. We're Americans. And we enjoy all that. And when God gives it, we can enjoy the gifts of God. But I'm going to tell you, the focus has to be on God, the giver himself. And if we lose all else, we have him, we're okay. You see, sin isn't worth it. Get the big picture here, friends. These are amazing movements of God where everything changes in a nation, sometimes on the globe. And you know, when Jesus comes back, it's to take his own. He's got to have a bride to take. Doesn't just say dead in Christ shall rise first. There are some who are alive and remain. And so I believe it's in the heart of God based on Peter because he delays his coming, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that there be a great awakening before Jesus comes again. Because it's the heart of God to save the savable and revive the revivable before judgment falls. And friends, it is time that we wake up to what really matters. You can get a passion for God to be seen, a passion for God to be manifested and get our eyes out of everything else. And all the closet sins and pocket sins and and, uh, uh, all of that stuff be put away and seek the Lord until he come and rain righteousness upon us. Ah, yes. Let God arise. That's the big picture.